Welcome to RPG Archive. Uh, we got a hell of a show today, and our usual co-host is back. It's Teddy from Majority. Hello, everyone. It's me, Majority. Happy to be back here on the Archive. Yeah, we got a pretty great show. And uh, we're also on the Button Mappers, which we're currently in Zombie Month slash Motor Month, I think, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Whatever it is. Uh, we're, but we're in Zombie Month, which is... Close to fitting for the game we're playing today, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, the PS1 classic. Did I almost pick this for the game talk? And then last minute I was like, eh, you know, let me just save it. <laughs> what am I going to do? Am I going to, you know, do a button mappers review, a majority review, and an RPG archive episode on the same game? Yeah, I wear you know, at that out. point, I'm going to hate it for the rest of my life, <laughs> and I don't want to do that with Symphony of the Night. Well, well, speaking of all that, you've been quite the uh, the Castlevania expert lately. You played all the games up to Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Is that true or accurate? I at least dabbled in them. A couple of them are too obtuse, namely Castlevania 2 II and 3, although Brian swears that I could do three. Hmm. I have beaten up to this point and reviewed Castlevania NES, Super, Bloodlines, and Symphony of the Night. And I did play a little bit after I beat Circle of the Moon, and I started Harmony of Dissonance, and then it flipped the castle, and I was like, mm, uh, I don't really <laughs> want to do that with the Game Boy Advance game. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's good because you can fill in some of the holes when we start talking about the past, the the, the series history. Because I tried playing the Super Nintendo one and immediately put it down. Did not I remember? <laughs> Absolutely hated that <laughs> game. Um, but this one is a lot better, so that's good. Uh, all right, you ready to jump in? Sure, let's jump. And actually, just before we do. Uh, to the viewers at home, you know, we got a couple of good projects going on right now. We are now at kind of a halfway point in Dragon Quest Seven, So, you know, Dragon Quest fans out there, hold tight. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're both at probably a similar place now in that game. But uh, Archive coming soon. Dragon Quest Seven. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the development of Symphony of the Night. This comes from Wikipedia. In 1994, development began on a Castlevania game for the 32X, retroactively known as the title under the title Castlevania The Bloodletting. Ooh. A playable prototype was created, but Konami decided to refocus the efforts on the PlayStation, and the game was canceled as a result. Changes were made to these initial ideas, and the project became Symphony of the Night move <laughs> <laughs> okay so 32x that was sega 32x sega okay and is this be was the castlevania before this on sega there was a bloodlines game on the genesis but that one's kind of a I don't know. It's it's not even I don't think it's considered canon or if it is it's like years in the future like World War 1 setting. Uh the other ones Rondo of Blood and Dracula X were on the PC Engine, uh, Turbo Graphics. Rondo of Blood is the other one on the collection that you and I have. Okay. Um other than that there was no Oh, there was the yeah, there was nothing on the gen um I'm sorry, the 32X or the Sega CD. Okay. Okay. So that's weird. It, it because there was also okay. When was um, Castlevania for Super Nintendo released? Was that ninety two? That was a launch title. Oh, ninety one. Dang. Okay. So they were kind of going back and forth. Then looks like between Sega and Nintendo, they didn't really have a favorite. Uh, I think yeah, they were just kind of getting their feet wet and. The, the interesting thing about Castlevania 2, not the second game, but just Castlevanias in general up to that point, was I think that they had like different development teams or something. Mm, okay. 
So, like, the ideas were kind of like... Well, the NES ones, I think it's the same guy who developed all three, and then he just disappeared. And then after that, um, there's, like, distinct differences between the Super Nintendo and the Genesis version. Okay. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So they... they because you'd think that they would just... I mean, obviously, now is a different time, but you'd think back then they would just try to port the, the, the versions over or something. But I guess a lot of games back then, they weren't just direct ports. Like the, I remember Aladdin was different, and that's the only one I can think of. Because it was so... Back then, it was so... The competition was so fierce that... Like, like if we think there's... It's always funny hearing people say now, like, oh, it sucks that there's there's, like, first person or first party games and... They don't. They're like exclusives to one console. It's like back in the day, it was like it was way more cutthroat. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. like even the same game with the same name wasn't the same game. It was like completely different versions of these. So it's always funny to see that. But it's weird to see the Castlevania because, like, from a financial perspective, wouldn't it just be easier to duplicate a game and just try to port it over? That's always so been so interesting to me. What did that happen on at the time? I mean, I guess the Final Fantasy is to the PlayStation. Yeah, yeah, I guess those those happen. I, I, I'm always just so con- confused by it because it seems like such a no-brainer, and they do it now like candy. But back then, they, they were like, it was like every console had to have its own version of the games if they were going to make two. So, I don't know. Different times, I guess. Uh, but they did move on to the PlayStation. Uh, the, the, in this interview from Shmuplations, they talked to Igarashi and Hagihara, which we'll get into them in a second. But they're the the big two names for this game. Igarashi says, or uh, they, they asked, conversely, what are any were there any difficulties with the new hardware? Talking about the PlayStation, Igarashi says probably the background since we were making a side scroller. Hagihara said there's no hardware support for scrolling on the PSX. So we ended up using the same methods for displaying character sprites to display the backgrounds. That ate, uh, that ate up a lot more of the processor power than we anticipated. Another issue is that while we were glad to have more memory to work with, compiling the game took an hour. Took an entire hour, during which time you couldn't do anything. That was annoying. I have coded personally, and compiling has never taken me an hour, but also <laughs> I've com- I've done it way later, and <laughs> so, so it's, I'm sure it's gotten more advanced than then. What um, does that mean, compiling? So I, I've never compiled for a video game, but in the in the stuff that I've coded, you're compiling to make sure that there's no like bugs that will happen. Because there are some in my in code that I've done, there's bugs that literally will just present themselves if you look close enough, and that the the system can understand that. So when it's running through it, it's compiling and saying, uh, okay, here you would have a problem. It would like literally crash if you tried to run this. So then you can go and fix it and then keep going. Um, so that's generally what compiling is as far as I know it means. I don't know if it means something different from them. Maybe it means like packaging it in a certain way. But it, yeah, it sounds like it sounds like these games are bigger than they were used to, which I guess makes sense. Maybe they had to compile at every interval. Like any time that they were working on the game, afterwards they would compile it. Absolutely. That's but the best practice for coding. Right. It's not like yeah. one hour, oh, there is one hour of my life. It's like, no, one, one hour a day for every day we work on this. Hopefully they compile and then, yeah, go like take a lunch or <laughs> go away for a while. <laughs> or compile at the end of the day or whatever it is. Hopefully. The Castlevania series has a long history. Compared with the previous games, what is the biggest change in Symphony of the Night? Igarashi says, no whip. And he's kind of joking. Not wanting to use the same story with the holy whip-wielding member of the Belmont clan was probably the biggest change. On top of that, Simon Belmont has a macho image, but this time we chose a more refined, aesthetic look. Do you do you think that the whip, or the, the main character, is the biggest change? When I think of this game, I think it's... <laughs> I mean, I just think of the exploration, which he he does mention there's another yeah. game that has close to this. But to me, that's the biggest change is it's not a straight side scroller. Yeah, that is the biggest change. <laughs> okay. The, you can't deny that. It spawned a genre. Yes. You know, that, what he's talking about is a cosmetic thing. But I think that's just like a classic like. Um, he's joking with us. You know, either it's a joke or like he's just being like a dev, you know. <laughs> 
I did read when I was like doing my research for this game that people think Igarashi is not a very nice person. Apparently, he's got he's got a reputation for being kind of a dick to people. <laughs> anyway, he, um, he's the same guy that rejects the the genre moniker of Metroidvania. So, take that for what you will. Well, we'll get into that later. I'm sure. Well. <laughs> with the added RPG elements, it feels like there's a lot of freedom in Symphony of the Night. Although I did get lost a lot at first. So I think some background to this interview, by the way, it was taken in 1997. So a lot of the things that we as gamers understand now just weren't, weren't were, were new back then. So, I mean, yeah, I guess in a, in a way you get lost, but it, you pretty easily figure out where to go in this game. Um, but maybe back then it wasn't as obvious to people that were just used to left to right side scrollers um in response igarashi does say we gave the player a lot of freedom because we wanted to lengthen the play time for an action game which is usually short if people spend 58 dollars on a game they should get 58 dollars worth of enjoyment from it even when a game is very difficult defeating enemies isn't very exciting is it i thought it would be fun for players to get experience from enemies and level up so i added rpg elements what what he just put so simply right there has basically become the foundation for every single action game like going forward <laughs> i think that's so uh, you know i just you know i was I didn't want it to be boring so i added some rpg <laughs> elements you know yes <laughs> <laughs> i find that so fascinating this to me is like one of the starting points of that like like you don't see an action game now where there's no stats or where there's no like no item or no nothing that you can improve upon it's there that that basically died and it's probably partly due to this game i'm sure the P, there's still games are coming out like that but this game really solidifies that you can have an action game with rpg elements now and uh it's the, just the norm for the industry at this point Prior to this, are there any significant action RPGs that come to your mind? I think Ease was in full bloom, although that I, I don't have any experience with that series, so I couldn't really tell you, but I'm pretty confident that might fit this bill. Um, Zelda has always teetered on it, which fits for this game, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But it's always kind of teeter, but not quite been an RPG. We talked about it on the button mappers. So if you want to check that out, <laughs> there was an episode. I don't remember what it was, but is it an RPG? So just look <laughs> for everything. Yeah, I think that's what it was called. Is it an RPG? Um, oh, geez. I mean, there's, think, there's, yeah, well, you could say a couple of them are like, it's a question like oh, Zelda. Is it an RPG? This one was a resounding. Yes, this yeah. is an RPG. So what you know, an ease is a little obscure, Terry. Sorry, but this game, Symphony of the Night, is like legendary. To me, this was like the first of its kind, or like the most notorious of its kind. It's almost like the Mario One. Mm -hmm. You know, like the timeline of action RPGs. While there may have been some before Symphony of the Night, starts at Symphony of the Night. Yeah, which I found so interesting. And he worded it so simply. Like, I've never just seen it so plainly. It's boring to just kill monsters, so I added RPG elements. Like, holy shit. Like, that could just doing my job. <laughs> <laughs> that would make. I can't even tell you how many games that would make more playable for me if they just had an RPG element added to it. it it's insane. And I, I never thought of it that way that it's like. The act of actually killing the enemies isn't that exciting, but once you put like experience points to it, HP, um, items that you can they can drop that like you can keep and use later and do all that. Once you add that to it, now every enemy is a potential to improve your character, and gives you incentive to do stuff like fight and do stuff. So, yeah, I think that's genius. So good for him. He may have <laughs> saved gaming for me personally in the future. <laughs> <laughs> they ask him, can you tell us the origins of Alucard, Alucard's name? You know is, that, one. is that a serious question? 
Did this guy... <laughs> well, you're about to get a not serious answer. <laughs> uh, she says, it's Dracula spelled backwards, of course. I heard it was a kind of nickname for Dracula. We had used it in Castlevania 3, so we took it and used it here, too. The Alucard from Castlevania 3 wasn't very cool, though, says Hagi Hara. Was that his name in Castlevania 3? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So Pretty it's the, yellow, dude. It's he the turns same. Into a bat. Same name? Same guy? Yes. This takes place after Rondo. That's why it gets placed in uh, the collection with it. Uh, so. I don't know if it, I don't think it's the same, but I, I don't fully know the lore, so I, I can't really comment on it. Okay. We need the lore experts in the chat to or in the, in the YouTube comments to tell us the connection so we can be better versed. They asked, how is it that Alucard, despite being Dracula's son, can use holy weapons and sub weapons? Ikarashi said, this isn't officially in the story. I found this interesting. But in the backstory in my head, his mother was descended of holy blood so he can use those weapons. That's why Alucard has both the powers of light and dark, which was something we had decided on at the outset of the development. Hagihara said, in the early planning stages, we had an alignment system. If you use the sub-weapons a lot, you would have a holy alignment. And if you use magic a lot, you'd have a dark alignment. Igarashi said, yeah, and the ending would have changed based on your alignment. We had various subtitles for the game in mind, too, like... Oh, shoot. In Shmuplations, hey, there was a, a subtitle before, for that. Before you continue, I'm remembering that partway through the game, Alucard has like a flashback with Belmont, and then he thinks of the NES uh, Simon Belmont. Hmm. He says, oh, there's a Belmont in here, and then he has a, like a bubble, and he's like, Simon? Remember that? It's like a eight bit um like thought bubble in the game. No, I don't remember that. Oh, uh, okay. So I think what's going on here is because he's like part Dracula's son, he's like he's gone on multiple adventures. So probably with Simon and probably with Richter. Okay. And apparent so it's all it's it's not quite but like almost canon that his mom was a holy person then because obviously his dad is Dracula right modern day Hercules bat Hercules bat Hercules <laughs> and I love that they had an alignment system that's even going way up to like Knights of the Old Republic two thousand four that's insane how forward thinking they were on that one if they could have implemented it clearly they they didn't but. Space that, limitations? Was that it? Um, I would guess, but it doesn't say specifically. But yeah, damn, that's freaking awesome. That would have been that would have been wild. Because yeah, in, in Knights of the Old Republic, you can go dark side or light side on your alignment, and the choices you make will give you those points. And so yeah, the ending will is different based on if you're a good guy, like a light side guy or a dark side guy. Which was so freaking cool at the time. The choices in Kotor are like more, like they they line up with like a, a good or a bad decision. Using a sub weapon versus using magic to determine your alignment. Like honestly, I'm happy they dropped it. <laughs> I don't think I used magic once this playthrough. If I did, it was on accident. Yeah, I don't think I did either. That would, been metamorphosis. Very, that would have been very <laughs> obscure, for sure. Yeah. But it's kind of cool that they, they were thinking of that. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah, you know, just flesh it out a little bit. Just made it a bit, maybe a little better. <laughs> they talk about the familiars here. Um, Igarashi says all the familiars get really strong if they're leveled up. Uh, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I know there's something in here I wanted to say. Um, the familiars familiars were something we barely had time to finish and they almost didn't get added. 
Yeah. So most of the enemies are are not really balanced with regard to the player using a familiar. I'm trying to say is please don't over level the familiars. And then I think one of them is the sword, which can become like your weapon or something at level ninety nine. Yeah, yeah. That's at level fifty you can equip it, and at level ninety nine it's extremely powerful. So I didn't know that. I didn't get to this. I didn't get the sword till like almost the very end of the game when I was just exploring. Mm. To that point, I think I had like one or two, maybe three familiars. I used the bat. But my understanding that original PS one version uh, doesn't have all the familiars. Yes, it has some they, removed. It, yeah. Right, and then the later versions would bring them in, so you actually have more of an opportunity to, uh, you know, abuse the familiar system in later entries. <laughs> that was cool. I like that little imp. Oh, I don't remember the imp. You need him to like hit a button or something. I did anyway. Okay. I use yeah, I use the bat the whole time. I think I, cool. I started using the fairy and then I just didn't really see it. So I switched over to the bat and I said, hell yeah, man, this guy's cool. I don't even remember what the fairy does. She doesn't heal you. Yeah, I don't remember. I, that's what, that was why I stopped using her. I was like, I don't really understand what you do. So. <laughs> you gotta go. Apparently, she's really useful against the hardest boss in the game. His name is like Galgamut or something. Mm -hmm. I saw videos of that. Apparently, just stand there and deal like crazy amounts of damage. Like, yeah. <laughs> that seems dumb. It's a hard boss. It destroyed me the first time I found him. Hmm. But I was reading about that too. Anyways, we can continue. What is the max percentage you can get on the map? Igarashi says it's actually 200.6%. If you uncover the entire castle, it's 100%. And the inverted castle also has 100%. Plus the underground waterway part for the extra 0.6%. We set the normal castle completion at 100% so as to put one endpoint to the game's progression. What we were thinking is that people wouldn't defeat Dracula on their very first playthrough. That's what happened to me. We wanted them to defeat Richter once. Then, after feeling like they'd beat Richter and cleared the game, they decided they decided to aim for 100% completion in the normal castle and uncover all the places they didn't get to. In doing so, they discovered the inverted castle and feel like they'd found something special. When players defeated Richter... They wanted them to be wondering what happened to death. What about all of Alucard's stolen equipment? A lot to unpack there. <laughs> yeah. I will say the inverted castle was pretty genius. At, okay, we can get straight to it. That was like the moment that the game showed itself to me. Where I was like... You know, I knew. I knew about the inverted castle. Oh, yeah, because I've heard it in, like, maybe game reviews over the years or something. Oh, yeah, I got to the part where the game flips. You know, But it's just not the same until you experience it for yourself. Mm -hmm. You spend so much time exploring, progressing, maybe not even to 100% in the core castle. And then you go up, and it's it's like, it's not just the castle upside down. It's the castle upside down, but the concepts are completely different. The music is completely different. It's probably the best mirror mode I've ever played. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was neat. And it's a it's like a it's like an a very rare instance of a game that has a playable metaphor. Like it's literally just like that's like gaming and 4d or something that's just crazy how they accomplished that so good on them for thinking it's master yeah. quest to shame oh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah very cool and it's good that they were they were thinking about like I, I think it's smart to tell people how much of a percentage they've completed and just very funny to show that it goes out to 200.6 percent because i'm sure people were pulling their hair out looking at that number <laughs> yeah well it's a, it's a trick right because it's like oh i 100 percent. no you didn't you did not 100 percent the game but they want you to think that it wouldn't make sense to put that you've only got 50 percent of the map because mm -hmm. you don't know what's coming yeah i don't know there's going to be a whole segment after this yeah 
And I like, even though I understood that like the castle would flip, I didn't know what it meant. I think, um, I don't know. I, it was just like, although I didn't get 200% or 200.6, whatever, you know, every part of the map get like going up just felt significant. Felt like I was really, you know, exploring this huge terrain. And that's, you know, if we're just going into exploration and the value of it, this castle's huge. Dracula's castle has so many moving parts to it. Yeah. And once you think you're finished, you're not. <laughs> you just began, man. Yeah. So it, cool. It literally turned your expectations upside down, which is cool. <laughs> And the other thing I love about the inverted castle is everything prior was item based progression where you need certain relics in order to uh, advance. But by the time you're in the inverted castle, you really have all of them. Right. So you're just at that point, that's true freedom. Right. That's true freedom to go anywhere. Yeah, that's that's Dragon Quest. You have the flying castle. And you can sail over the mountains. It's just <laughs> sky's the limit, and it really just it puts all your skills to the test on it. Because there are there are some really hard parts in the upside down castle. Mm -hmm. It's like, jeez, I went through a couple of them, and I said, "Oh, I'm not ready for that." <laughs> and I looked for some different paths. I looked for a save room. I was like. <laughs> I just lost like 10% of progress. <laughs> I want that to happen again. Yep. Uh, what were some of your early ideas for Symphony of the Night at the outset of the development? Igarashi says, our first idea was to, was to use the story and setting of Vampire Killer and make the final Belmont Vampire Hunter your enemy. Another idea I had, and this is also from the setting of Bloodlines, is that it was supposed to be Quincy Morris who defeated Dracula but it was actually Alucard who defeated him. I had even thought how this would work with the ending visuals. Also, the decision to make this a more exploratory action game was to extend the short life of normal action games a bit. And this was something we decided from the very beginning. Furukawa, who I'm sure I'll figure out who that is later. At the time of the development, Section Chief ordered us to make the Ultimate Dracula game. No one really knew what Ultimate meant. But all the developers had talked it over, and the result was Symphony of the Night. So what do you all think? Ultimate Dracula. Try and picture that. <laughs> I like this guy. Um, I don't know what any of those people are. Quincy Morris, Vampire Killer? Is it, Those are just people from so Bloodlines? So I'm confused because Bloodlines has John Morris and Eric Lacard as the playable characters. I don't know who Quincy was. I think Quincy maybe is his father who was killed by Dracula. I think what's going on in Bloodlines is that John and Eric are out to, to kill Dracula again or something or take revenge on him. Yes, Quincy is the father of John Morris. Okay. And he killed Dracula in, in 1897. Hmm. Although he was fatally wounded. Vampire Killer, I'm confused because that's the name of the whip. Oh. It's also it is the name of the first game known in Japan as Aku Majo Dracula. I think it's like the arcade version or something. Weird. It was developed for the MSX2. Maybe that was like their normal version, not the NES version. The parallel version of the original Castlevania, which debuted a month earlier for the Famicom. Under the same Japanese title. However, it was localized first in Europe and was published without the Castlevania branding that the franchise would start using. Maybe he's just being edgy calling it Vampire Killer. Igarashi. <laughs> <laughs> or like Ego Rashi. Yes. <laughs> yes. This guy. Why you did pull you pull a fast shot at us, didn't you? <laughs> He's trying to. <laughs> Why did you choose Alucard as the protagonist? Igarashi says, since we increased the size of the player character, we had to think about how that balance would work with the traditional uh, whip. 
The problem is that the whip would reach across the entire screen, so we decided to make an action game based on other weapons instead. We also wanted a character whose abilities could grow and change, and to that end, we thought using a character who could transform into other things would be more interesting. Given those two points and the need to connect the protagonist to the history of Castlevania, we chose Alucard. Furukawa says, from a visual's perspective, we thought it would be cool to have a stylish man as the lead. The image of Simon in the instruction booklet of the very first Famicom Akumaju Joe Dracula was slender and stylish. But somewhere along the way, the Belmont image got changed to a pumped up, muscle bound man. And Symphony of the Night seemed like a good chance to change that image. I also think the Demon Castle title doesn't really suggest Simon Belmont as the main character, though that might be overstating things. So it's weird, because in this in this age, too, it seems like a lot of games were going for a more bleak, slender. Yes. I was going to use a different word, but I like that better. (laughs) Like I'm thinking Cloud from Final Fantasy. He's a sleeker guy. Um, And maybe this has to do with the rise of like, and I, I, dude, I'm going straight from left field here, but more of like an anime influence. Obviously, Dragon Ball Z is not that way, but maybe other animes at the time. I don't know pop culture i think like that kind of 2000s 90s rock like that's you know that's the aesthetic a little bit okay yeah because like, like the, the big guy was like blade. the 80s like the big muscle guy like arnold schwartz oh the conan yeah and then i think yeah maybe in the 90s it turned to sleeker My biggest regret is that Konami never made a Castlevania movie starring Arnold Schwarzenegger as Simon Belmont. Oh, dude. <laughs> Rockla, I'm come to take down. <laughs> <laughs> this <is> I, Simon. <laughs> Feel, Feel my, my whip. whip. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. That would have been spectacular. Oh, my God. It's not too late. It isn't. It's not too late. You're right. Yeah. You can still do it. We can be Quincy. <laughs> I'm Quincy <laughs> now. <laughs> my son, John. <laughs> this is his best friend, Alucard. <laughs> Alucard, your name is funny. It sounds like the uh, backwards Dracula, which I killed. <laughs> Come to my castle. Oh, wait, it's Alucard. I think she's got the mic. <laughs> oh, someone needs to present this to him. That would be phenomenal. Okay. Uh, Symphony of the Night is the newest Castlevania since Bloodlines. What things did you consider when making another entry in the series? Igarashi says With Symphony of the Night, our concept was to make a game that would overturn players' ideas about Castlevania, yet also feel like a Castlevania game. This is where I'm going to have to consult you. As for what things we specifically wanted to change, we wanted to make the action exploration-based, add RPG elements so anyone who put in the effort could beat it, no more one-hit kills, which is huge to me, by the way. The player character would not use a whip, no more stairs. Change the visual style. Our biggest concern was how using these new ideas as a base to create a game that would fit cleanly into the timeline and world of Castlevania and not harm the image of previous games in the series. So I have one thing to say about this, and then I'll shoot it over to you who can really tell me the answer on this. But this game did so much harm to the previous games in the series to me. I literally cannot go back. So, Teddy, you tell me all these things they said they wanted to do. Did they succeed? And and how do you think they did it? Succeed? It was a raging success, culturally. As far as the identity of Castlevania is up to that point, it just completely transformed it, though. And I don't know, like, the thing is, at those classic Castlevanias, you could still play them. You could still enjoy them. I just don't really see many games like the NES ones nowadays. For better or worse, because, you know, some people don't like that. 
used to not like that, but having recently gotten to Mega Man's and Castlevania's, I kind of do like that. And I think like Shovel Knight would probably beg to differ. And then, you know, a couple of other indie games, like I think there's one called Cyber Shadow that's like the Ninja Gaiden. And Ninja Gaiden was very similar, being like a very difficult you know, memorization based kind of thing. Um, the thing was, he said it's like not satisfying to like kill an enemy without RPG elements, but I disagree with that. Like, I think it's actually when you feel like you've mastered a level, like, that's gratification in and of itself, especially when they're really freaking hard and like you have to work for it. Um, so did they succeed? I mean, vaguely, yes. Uh, was Symphony of the Night a masterpiece? <sighs> I feel like it's so close. I But there are a couple of things holding it back for me. Interesting. Yeah, the no more one hit... That? Kind yeah, the no more one hit kills for me is a big one. That is such a detractor for me for for old games. Is that what's a one hit kill in the Castlevania? Is just getting knocked back into a pit. Yeah, which is a pain in the ass. I don't like that. Yeah. So the, this they got even it, so. Yeah. The later ones let you like step on the stairs, and I think there's a some of them. There's like a way to reduce knockback or something. Maybe maybe it's in the Game Boy Advance one that I played recently. Maybe I'm just confusing it in my mind. But mm. yeah, to me the more, no more one hit kills thing is huge because nothing makes me more angry than getting knocked back into a pit and then it's like because of that you now have to start over from whatever checkpoint. Checkpoint. Yeah. I'm like, I remember. I think that probably happened on the Super Nintendo one. I can't remember, but I'm sure when that happened, I just said no. Um, yeah. But I think what the, I don't even know if they intended to do it, but they really completely changed the 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 franchise with this one to the point that I mean this would be the dividing line of actually uh, I don't know if it did harm to the, the franchise. You might argue that I, at this point I played two of the Castlevania Advance ones. I mean they're good, but you can see they're clearly trying to be Symphony of the Night. I bet one more so than another of the two that I played <laughs> where it literally flips the freaking castle. But, um, and you know, the standard is so high up to that point. I haven't played the DS one, so I can't speak to those. And Lords of Shadow is like a weird nether realm that we don't talk about. So, um, but, the, but you know what? I know Terry really likes the PS2 Castlevania Curse of Darkness. Um, so until I play those, I have to abstain. From, from claiming that it harmed the franchise definitively. Well, I, don't, I don't know if I would even say harm, but just to me, it like changed, changed. it. Like they definitely changed it. Cause like now when people, when you say Castlevania, you're almost invariably talking about symphony of the night or one of the ones that came after it. But then there's the, the other Maybe. group, there's the other group that's like to them the, the the Castlevanias are the old ones. So to me, this was like a literally a dividing line between Yeah, that which is why it's not flush, because you know, different people will have different interpretations. Like I really think that first Castlevania is iconic. Simply the Night's iconic. Sure. Um I don't know if any other ones in the series are that same iconic as either of those two. Axioms, I guess. I don't know. Well, people really like the Super Nintendo one, but yeah, I don't think it's as iconic necessarily as the first one. Yeah. Because, I mean, once you're first, you can't you can't top that almost. And so it's like um, the Castle of the Symphony of the Night was the first to be like this and done so well that it spawned like almost a rebirth of the series. Well, it's one thing to be first, but it's another to be first and like a kind of legendary i don't think the first sonic game is legendary you know, people don't remember sonic one they remember sonic two that is that first, is a good point yeah first zelda game like i almost think that one goes under like <laughs> because a lot of people are just like oh yeah nes zelda yeah i think that one was a, a, a product of its time <laughs> 
because I know it was legendary when Take it came it, right? out. <laughs> yeah, but but we've moved past that. Yeah, now you you look at it and like see just all of its flaws, and it's kind of hard to overlook. But there are two like main Castlevanias, and one is the classic Vanias, classic Castlevanias. That that branches all the way up from and leading to you know, Castlevania One, right before Symphony of the Night. Then you have that chunk that's like Symphony of the Night action adventure RPG. Game Boy Advance, PlayStation 1. Uh, and then maybe you could turn the 3D ones, you could categorize them there. I don't know. And then it kind of just stops and the series dies in 2014. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's there. there is a rift, for sure. Yeah. It's interesting that we call it we call the like the genre Metroidvania in general, like that's the generic term. But the the big influence apparently was the Legend of Zelda. Um they loved the idea of the Legend of Zelda where you use items to progress through things. I have a picture here and I, I was looking at it yesterday putting this together and I was like these are not pictures from the Legend of Zelda. So I'm not really sure why they're on here. <laughs> but they are. So it's like I it gets the point across, I suppose. Um but um but yeah, the, apparently their big influence was the Legend of Zelda, not what some might consider would be Metroid, which is weird because they the the similarities between this and Metroid are are very obvious. So I was I was kind of were you surprised that the Legend of Zelda was a huge influence on this? Yeah, it doesn't make the most sense to me. The the thing about Zelda and Metroid is they're more similar than we give them credit for. Mm -hmm. Did Zel I think Zelda NES came first before Metroid on the NES? So technically, Zelda was the you know original item based you know uh, action adventure game. Then Metroid is is a platformer first and foremost um i guess like you know symphony of the night is too but it's more action adventure i don't know i just see that when i see metroid it, it just seems more because like zelda is really known for a lot of outdoor like it has its dungeons but it's in like the traversal has always been this big outdoor grand world Whereas Castlevania is literally the title is ca it's Castlevania is the the castle like you're in the one little the castle enclosed it's a huge castle but you're you're enclosed in it whereas Metroid is usually very similar to that where it's more of an enclosed world it feels tight I mean, there's been on ships it's been on like a planet kind of situation um, it to me that they're so close I'm surprised that they didn't say like. Oh, we took it. I can see where eventually the 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 DNA comes from Zelda, perhaps, because Mario is supposed to be the left to right platformer, side scroller. Zelda was the complete antithesis of that—a completely open, go left, right, up, down, any direction. So I could see where the the DNA eventually comes to that. But this is 1990, I guess 94 when they started this. So 1994, releasing in 97, Metroid's been out. <laughs> Metroid's come out, and it's weird to be like Metroid wasn't the influence of this. It was Zelda. When Metroid is like, you could almost just reskin Metroid and, and add some RPG elements, and it would be this game. So it's. it's really I mean, strange. it literally adopts the freaking map from Metroid. It is, but the prob the thing about that is, um, I guess Super Metroid was out. It takes the map from Super Metroid. I don't think Metroid One had a map. Right, I think people had to to draw it, which is awesome. It's fucking yeah. cool. Uh, so I did just do a quick Control F on the wiki page, and just to get something that he says about Zelda. And the best I can get is that um, Garashi looked to the Legend of Zelda series. Well, actually, I should read this fully. Um, Garashi felt that regular action games were too short, and he wanted to create a game that could be enjoyed for a long time. 
Consequently, the development team abandoned the traditional stage-by-stage -stage progression of the previous Castlevania games in favor of an open castle that the player could freely explore. Igarashi looked to the Legend of Zelda series, which involved much exploration and backtracking to extend the amount of gameplay. Igarashi was able to use the critical reaction from Castlevania II Simon's Quest, which was more focused on exploration than action, to pitch Symphony of the Night to Konami, the development team used inspiration from The Legend of Zelda to make most of the castle areas initially inaccessible to the player. The player would gradually obtain items and abilities that progressively opened up the castle. Their idea was to reward exploration while retaining the hack and slash action of the previous games. I kind of get this a little better now. So you know how Metroid with like the exploration, it's almost like everything's pivotal. Yeah, there's like some reward to exploring, but it's almost mandated. Whereas in The Legend of Zelda, you you are exploring for heart pieces or weapon upgrades and things like that. I think that's what they're talking about when they're talking about um, the inspiration from Zelda adventuring. Mm. Yes, the actual style of exploration in side-scrolling fashion is very Metroid, but um, it's almost like a synthesis of both. It is, yeah. I, I wonder if they, I wonder if they didn't mention Metroid just to avoid like some kind of lawsuit or something. <laughs> But he does say he likes the uh, the moniker. Um, it says the genre should really be called a Zeldavania because it was inspired by Zelda, not Metroid. Although he say the Metroidvania fits very well. <laughs> Other figures in the game industry have since used Zelda Troid, Zeldavania interchangeably. I don't know. I wouldn't use either of those, but <laughs> sound miserable. <laughs> you yeah, play the new I... Zelda Troid game. <laughs> Yeah, I it just see that seems like such a stretch. So that doesn't tell you almost anything about it, because as much as he might, he's saying that it, Zelda inspired it, or, or it was partially inspired by Zelda. It is nothing like it in any, almost any sense of the word. Like it's, it's they're very very different. Whereas Metroid, it, it is similar. The exception of I think the heart piece comparison. The life potions and the um, heart grids. But wasn't that basically a Metroid anyway? The capsules? What, with the health yeah. capsules? Yeah. And then rockets, missiles. And... Yeah, that's true. Uh, Ayami Kojima uh, became the artist for the series. I didn't have a lot on her. I looked her up. Um, but basically... This is her first game with Castlevania, and she became the artist for Castlevania going forward as far as, like, the box art that you see. I, I looked at some of the things that it was, like, about how she draws, and my eyes kind of glazed over. I don't have any artistic knowledge, so it just was like, okay, sure. Um, but I will say that her art is, is very good, and certainly when I think of Castlevania, I think of her art. So good on her. <laughs> I don't really have much else. The box art for that NES one, though. <laughs> I haven't seen it. But just You've seen it. Come I will, on, Simon holding the whip and Dracula's like looking down. Okay, okay, I've seen it. it. But um, whenever that's good. Okay, because I'm thinking of most NES box art, and especially Mega Man, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not on that level. No. <laughs> At least <they> did something. <laughs> After uh, the other night, it's literally just the castle on the case. Yeah. Well, but they used her artwork for I'm sure the art, like the the book inside. And I've seen tons of pictures of it, like of, of um, Alucard. I guess oh, I... she has multiple al aliases. So she was being interviewed as Hagihara in the thing. Oh, wait, but her name is. But why? What's who's Ayami Kojima? That's the artist. That's literally all I have on her. Her next, other this name next, is. No, this next part is Hagihara. This next part's completely Oh, separate. I see. I was confused. Okay, okay. I was at first, too. Just That's the way I... out of the dock. Yeah, yeah I was okay. like, what? <laughs> 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 Made this in a fever dream. Um, okay, next up is Toru Hagihara, one of the big honchos here. He was the producer and director. Um, oh, he's been that, and a programmer. He worked on Castlevania II, Rondo of Blood, Symphony of the Night, and Castlevania Chronicles. Um, seems like he's been working on it for a while. He was considered the primary director of this game, I believe, if I scroll down real quick. Yeah, he was the primary director. Igarashi was the assistant. So oh. from 
you know, as a as a major part of the Castlevania franchise, he is the beginning, a huge part of the beginning of it. Uh, Igarashi, I believe, would take it over from there, um, and be like a the major part of the later ones. But Hagihari was at this time big man and on campus, big man in charge. So I don't really have a lot to say about him. Uh, I think he was. Oh, no, no, no. Igarashi has the more interesting resume after this. <laughs> it is definitely Igarashi, yes. <laughs> Let's move on to Igarashi. Um, <laughs> he worked on a lot of Castlevania, especially after Symphony of the Night, where he was the assistant director. Um, and he worked on other games, too. Uh, he's, he was credited as a program on Gradius, too. And then he worked on this thing that I almost added to this thing but i won't do it toki meki memorial is a is a konami dating game it's an rpg dating game <laughs> almost like it, it reminded yeah. me when i was reading about it of like persona just, if you just took out like all the rpg like fighting and stuff and just did the social stuff that's what it sounded like to me so i thought it was really also had a uh, special thanks for castlevania rondo of blood there you go so he's <laughs> he's uh he's popular in there his alias is iga IGA, all caps. Cool. All right. Well, that's the development of it. Are you ready to move on to the game? Yeah, just a footnote about Igarashi. He did make uh, the Bloodstained game, which was like the return to Symphony of the Night. So yes. I don't have the full story there, but you know that was a Kickstarted game. And uh, I think the con- like the idea was that konami wasn't letting him make the castlevania games that he wanted to yeah uh, so he went and founded his own studio in order to do so makes sense konami what dipped out from gaming around mid 2010s somewhere in there 2015 ish mm-hmm. or something like that and they're like we're just gonna make pachinko machines so i guess igarashi didn't want to didn't want to make those <laughs> so good for him that reminds you too that that was like when they were making the like the Mega Man game. Although I heard this one came out a lot better than the Mega Man one did. Oh, way better. Yeah. <laughs> but good for him. Good for him. Symphony of the Night. Yeah, I think he oh, he oh. walked out like kind of unscathed, where others would kind of be tarnished. Yeah, that's unfortunate, man. It's always a shame when like the because like, I feel like the Kickstarter concept is should work. But clearly some people used it in different ways and it just turned out really poorly. And I, I just feel bad because I know a lot of people are looking forward to that Mega Man one. So what are the other ones even I mean obviously ukulele, but Oh, there there was um I think it's called Star Citizen. That's been in I think it's still in Kickstarter. It's raised over like a oh. billion dollars, I'm sure, at this point. And they just—it's a nightmare. I don't know. There, there, there's I'm sure plenty that I don't even know about that just came out that that are just like a disaster. I haven't funded any of them. I haven't found one that I should. Although uh, Sea of Stars just came out, or there's coming out at the end of this month, and I probably should have done the Kickstarter for that. That's supposed to be like a cross between Chrono Trigger and um, Suikoden. So. <laughs> I'll be definitely playing that on uh, Game Pass. <laughs> I'm such a shitty person. <laughs> Ever you don't know you don't know how it's going to be and with the track record like yeah it's not you know how many games have said they were going to be the next Chrono Trigger and they've all disappointed you. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. Hopefully, it's good enough that I buy it later because I'd love to support Let's it. See. Uh. It came out in 1997, this game, March 20th on the PlayStation in Japan. In North America, it came out on October 3rd, PAL region, November 1st. It would come out for the Saturn 360, PlayStation Portable, PS4, and apparently Android and iOS Mm. as late as 2020, March. What? What? Is that Japan only or something? I never heard of that. I would that I feel like I would know about that. <laughs> it's 
kind of neat. See if I could pull it up real quick. Versions and re-releases. That's got to be Japan only. It looks weird. Oh, wait a sec. Here we go. On October 26th. For, okay, Android and iOS ports of the game were released March 2020 based on the Dracula X Chronicles version. Uh, okay. <laughs> Does it have touch controls? What? <laughs> what the hell would that even play like? And you can use your controllers on most iOS games now. I guess. Like compatible with game controllers. It just seems so... It's just clearly not developed like that. Because, like, yeah, you can use controllers for your phones, and I've certainly done it, but most games are usually, like, they, they try to fit it so it's playable just at, with the, the phone. I just don't see that even being possible with this game. But I don't know. Maybe. Uh received its scores on release on the PlayStation its metacritic score was 93 out of 100 pretty damn good Xbox 360 it was 89 out of 100 it looks like it aged decently iOS it was 88 out of 100 uh, I don't even know what that would be um as far as sales go I had a hard time finding really really good sales numbers VG charts wasn't really showing it um i did find a wikipedia article but i used what little info vg charts had um and this is for the ps1 version sold 0.21 million in japan 0.58 million in north america and, and in total including all of the regions 1.27 million pretty good pretty good all around it was it was decent but i think it was considered like you know, for what it was, like a, a financial failure. Like this quote down here says, despite the popular... Wait, no, that's something else. But I thought I was reading about like how the critical acclaim came later. Yes, sales. it was a cult hit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of things probably contributed to that. It's like it was released on the PlayStation, which was new. It wasn't like their familiar territory. So you had like Sega and Nintendo and then they're like releasing Castlevania on it. Maybe that was a bit of a problem. Um, but certainly it became one of the PS1 classics that, that would people would be talking about later. So I thought that that's kind of interesting. But um, also it says here in the uh, like what you're starting to read that uh, despite the popular consensus of the time that 2D had become outmoded, Critics also highly praised the game's graphics for their smooth animation, impressive effects, and evocative ev evocation of atmosphere, which I would think maybe just from the outside looking in, people were not thrilled to play a 2D side scroller on a PS1. Maybe they just said like, "This looks old," which personally I actually agree with. That's one of my down comments on this game. I actually mm. don't love the graphics. But that's kind of it. Um, when it was released, it received wide critical acclaim. GameSpot hailed it as easily one of the best games ever released. Wow. And a true testament to the fact that 2D gaming is not dead by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, computer and video games said this may be old school style spelled S-K-O-O-L. It's pretty neat. But it feels like the freshest thing of the year. Classic written all over it. GamePro gave it a perfect 5 out of 5, calling it one of the best games of the year. I love reading what it lost stuff to. It was awarded PlayStation Game of the Year and Side-Scrolling Game of the Year and was a runner-up for Best Music behind Parappa the Rapper. <laughs> Kick, punch, it's all in the mind. Oh, my God. And Game of the Year behind GoldenEye 007. Interesting. Hmm. God, gaming used to be so hot. Ah, uh, God, 007, Goldeneye. Holy shit! It's also sense. also named best sequel in their annual buyer's guide. It was game of the year by PSM, although that's PlayStation Magazine, so it literally cuts out half of gaming when you do that, or actually, well, probably a little more. Um, yeah, it looks like. I mean, it 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 was received critically incredibly well. Its sales didn't quite reflect a game that was received this well, which is 
sad to say. Yeah, I think I have it here. I had it a second ago. Um, the game was lowballed as a prospect for a release in the United States, given relatively little advertising, receiving limited funding for its North American production, and was not and was initially not a major financial success. So the fact that it was the highest selling in the US region speaks volumes, given that they weren't like it didn't believe in this project. Yeah. That probably made them open their eyes a little bit. I mean, clearly, because they released like five games that all say, played like this in the coming years. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is huge. You know, when I was play, when I was at this age playing PlayStation games, for some reason, this game never crossed my crossed over to me. Like nobody I knew played it, which I guess makes I sense because it, it didn't sell very well. Yeah, not till like started doing YouTube. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, until then, I hadn't really heard much about it. I'm glad they made it accessible nowadays. You know? Yeah. Yeah, now you can play it. With most popular games, you can play it very easily on modern consoles in some form or fashion. Okay. You ready to talk about the story? Yeah, let's get into it. I can read this one if you want. Sure. Okay. Oh, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Story takes place during the year 1797, five years after the events of Rondo of Blood. It begins with Richter Belmont's defeat of Count Dracula, mirroring the end of the former game. I'll speak to that for a second. The final stage in Castlevania Rondo of Blood is the final or is the first battle in Symphony of the Night where you're fighting as Richter? That's it's cool. taken directly from the former game. Uh, however, despite Dracula being defeated, Richter vanishes without a trace. Castlevania rises again five years later, and while there are no Belmonts to storm the castle, Alucard, the son of Dracula, awakens from his self induced sleep decides to investigate what transpired during his slumber. And maybe that explains why he knows so little about Richter you know, going in. Mm. And if you get the bad ending, why he just presupposes that mankind has fallen evil. Okay. Meanwhile, Maria Renard, Richter's sister-in-law, enters Castlevania to search for the missing Richter. I think Maria, yeah, Maria was in Rondo of Blood as well. She was a little kid or something, but like you find her. So I don't, sister-in-law, maybe it's like adopted sister or something. I don't know, Lord. Weird. She assists Alucard multiple times throughout the game. There are four separate endings to the story. A certain sequence of events is followed. Richter is revealed to be under the influence of the dark priest. Daft! <laughs> <laughs> He's one bad man. <laughs> bad man pajama. After the latter is defeated, an upside-down version of Castlevania, the reverse castle, appears from the heavens. This castle contains another entire series of adventures crowned by the ultimate face-off between Alucard and his revived father, Dracula himself. Spencer, what do you think of the story of Castlevania Symphony of the Night? As somebody who never played any of the Castlevanias before, um... It was surprisingly easy to follow. Like, I mean, obviously, I don't know the context necessarily. But he, as I played it, somebody tried to kill Dracula. Or maybe he did. I couldn't really tell. I don't remember. But the castle was still there. And Alucard visits it and says, why is this castle still there? And then he searches through it. And Richter, who he somewhat knows... Uh, is is like the the big bad of it, and he's like, that's weird. And I also know who Maria is for some reason. Um, but that that's weird. I need to solve this, and that to me that's the story of it, which you know makes sense. It's not Final Fantasy, nor should it yeah. be. Actually, honestly, quite honestly, I found it pretty refreshing. 
because I know what games like I, I know what, what companies like Squaresoft at the time and Capcom did to games where they made the stories so needlessly complex and over the top. This one just felt like it was letting me play the game and just enjoy it. So I re- actually appreciated the simplicity of it. Granted, there's lots of tie-ins to the other games that I had no clue about, but I didn't think I needed them. I was fine with the story. I think less than you think. Like, yeah, there's a couple, but like, you don't really need to know, you know, who Richter is. The, to to play a Castlevania game, you need to understand one plot line. That's that every hundred years, Dracula respawns, and it's your job to, you know, the vampire hunters to take him down. And I think this one plays with that formula a little bit because uh you know the the irony is that he's already been you know destroyed by richter um but you're in here looking at richter like what's going on so yeah i don't know i I like that it plays with the formula but it is pretty easy to follow um overall and i think it's really smart how it starts with you playing as richter and then like you know, it seems like everything would be fine after that, but it's, you know, clearly not. Mm-hmm. And the moments where you do, you know, have human contact, besides the librarian, he's kind of a you know, dingus, uh, are refreshing. <laughs> you know, it's cool to see interactions, even in the very beginning, when Alucard comes to the castle and death greets him. Greetings, Alucard. What, do you come to see your father? You know, oh, well, let me take your weapons, you know. Um, yeah, I liked it. I like that. I also like Alucard like as a a framework for the game. Mm-hmm. You know, that's it's just so different. I guess it's kind of anti-hero. Uh, again, a, a reflection of the time. You know, the the yeah. protagonists again, like Cloud. They're, they're just these characters that are very aloof and seem like they don't want to be the hero. They don't want to do good necessarily. They just do it because they're in the position to do it. Uh, yeah, it definitely would be a um, a very different approach to previous, at least the, the timing of the old Castlevanias were in the 80s. The good guy is the good guy, and he's like, he does what's right for the for the good of the nation. Uh, he's very anti that, so that is cool. Yeah, one of my favorite moments is at the very end. And unfortunately, the dialogue has changed in your version, but uh, in mine, I had the original PS1 version. So when, I guess, spoiler alert, when Alucard comes to his father, Dracula, in the final segment of the game, it doesn't start off like a somber final boss moment or like, you know, intimidating. He's like, ah, Alucard, well met, my son. <laughs> it's, it's like... <laughs> I don't know. It's just it's it's endearing. Yeah, like yeah. Um, I mean, you got Alucard, Richter, and Maria. You are you already kind of went into those people. Um, you can play as Richter after you've beaten it once, and uh, Maria is playable in some editions as well. I fought Maria. Their first name. That's the trick. And Maria was the most annoying boss fight in the game for me. I didn't have a Maria boss fight, but I was playing the Xbox 360 version. This is the PS1 version. So you had it and I didn't. Her fight was just like her throwing like animals at me. It was so Yeah, that's annoying. very from Rondo of Blood. She uh her like sub weapons are literal animals. I guess she's a vegetarian, according to Terry. So that's why she you know, befriends that's the why animals. She and... throws animals at me is because she's a vegetarian. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm not gonna eat it, you eat it. <laughs> Enjoy this dragon. <laughs> yeah. Weird. All right. Well, let's talk about the gameplay a little bit. Um, uh, we got a lot to cover, but the main thing to talk about is the non-linear approach, especially compared to previous games. They talked about it a little bit. They wanted to add time to your play to your playthrough, um, and they want it to be just feel a little different than previous Castlevanias. Clearly, they succeeded in that. 
Um, we're going to get into Metroidvania concept later, but in general, how do you think they handled their first outing at non-linear gameplay? I'm trying to think if any of the other ones would be considered non-linear. Like, Bloodlines has two different character paths. They go on, di- like, they, they have different or unique ways of exploring the stages. Then Super Castlevania 4 has, like, some hidden rooms. Then Rondo of Blood actually has, like, an A path and a B path that you can take. But you can't complete the B path until you've completed the A path. It's weird. Hmm. Uh, so I don't, it's not their first entirely non linear game, but it's the first one where the foundation is like, okay, you know, it's Dracula's Castle, how about it? It's still very much progression or item based. Like you need certain relics in order to progress through different parts of the castle. Like you can tell there are specific areas you're supposed to go to. Um, but there is some flexibility in the first half of the game. And the second half is where it opens up completely. And I think it was a, you know, we talked about it before, but the second half of the game is what won me over. The first half is what got me started. And the second half is where I was like, wow, I can go anywhere. I could do anything. I could even go back to the original half if I want. And yeah. just go, you know, hunt for, you know, uh, building my character, bulking him up, you know? So... I think yeah, it, I I love that. I think it really speaks to how strong they were as developers that they were able to to take an idea. Like I read that idea like no one hit kills, which to me means no falling in pits cuz they've generally had health at least as I could recall. But no falling in pits. Okay, so how do you resolve that? You you put the map underneath the player as well as left to right. So if you fall into a pit, you're just going into a different room. Okay. That's interesting. That's an interesting solution to that. Um, And you never, you basically never have that. I mean, there's probably a couple places where you can do that, but in general, the whole map is like up, down, left and right. There is no left to right anymore in, in a very generic sense. So interesting solutions to, to problems that at the time were pretty normal. Like side scrollers in 1994 and 1997 were almost like what people considered gaming at the time. So, I mean, the RPG hadn't quite taken off yet. Well, 97? Seven was probably out around then, but still. Um, most people just said Mar- you're playing Nintendo, so you're, that means Mario, essentially. So... <laughs> Interesting solutions to those problems of how do we how do we resolve that? How do we add how do we make this not boring? How do we add playtime to this? And I think the nonlinear thing was genius. They they created a world instead of a series of left to right stages. And I love that. Yeah. It doesn't fully have all of the amenities you would expect from this type of game nowadays. So it's actually really challenging. Like you might know, oh, I need mist, the transformation in order to get through this door, but it's not marked on your map, not mine anyway. And so, you know, you could have multiple pockets of the map that are unexplored, but you might not remember, oh, I need to go back to this part with mist. You might be kind of like you get your upgrade and then you already forgot an hour ago that like this was this area, this is what I needed. So you like your sense of exploration actually needs to be heightened yes. compared to to modern uh, search action adventure games. And I like that. But I also found it a little intimidating sometimes, but I still thought it was like, it was a cool aspect. It's just that there is backtracking involved, which can be tough. Mm-hmm. There are some teleportals uh, around the map. Clunky. Yeah. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> like not like yeah. When you go to the teleportals, it takes you to the next one in like a set order, but it it doesn't let you just pick one to go to. It was, it was such a it was such like a oh my god this is a port and not a remake like that's the difference between a port and a remake in a port. It keeps the clunkiness. 
In a remake, they just solve it. They're like, which one of these squares do you want to go to? And then they would you would just pick it. You could say you could argue one or the other is better, and clearly, I think teleporting to the one you want is better. But as as far as it, they maintained it as it was when it was released, and I think that's so. It was interesting to see that they hadn't thought of that yet. It's, they didn't want to do it, or they didn't want to. Do it. I don't know, but to me, it just seems very clunky. Not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that was interesting. Um, nowadays, everything's so tutorialized, kind of like what you were talking about. It's like not only not only will you have to remember, oh, I haven't explored this section. I might have to come back once I have a new ability. But back, but nowadays, if they were to make this game, Alucard, the game would pause, and Alucard would put his hand on his chin, and he'd go, if only I could turn into mist here. <laughs> And then it would go back to the game and you would. And you're right. It would probably put something on the map that was like a missed icon or something. Right. Um, whereas this, none of that. It's like, you better oh. remember because <laughs> it's a big map and the, you're going to get something later that you don't know about. It's not handholdy at all. I mean, there's a couple points where I was like, what do I do here? Or how do I get up there? And it's just not spelled out. Mm-hmm. One of the rooms that was really freaking cryptic to me was the the clock room. Yes, I passed it several times, and I think I noticed on the map like you could could go up, and then one of them moved in, and the other didn't. Like, at what point is that one going to move? Do you know what the mechanic is there? I don't think I ever learned it. I just it was open one day and or one point, and I just went in. Left one turns every like fifteen minutes or something, or fi- no, not even. It's less. It's like every two minutes. Once like the second hand passes something, it moves for like a couple seconds. That's the left one. The right one, if you use the stopwatch sub weapon, mm. which is available like five candles down to the right, and if you go up that one, I think you get Alucard's equipment. Oh. Shit. Yeah, I never it's got that helpful. one. Yeah. Damn. That's pretty I don't cool. remember the middle. <sighs> middle. I don't remember having trouble with that one. Oh, there's no I don't think there is there is a thing in the middle. You just have to transform into the bat and then float up. Yeah. Um speaking of the tra- the transforming into the bat, there are several transformations in this a bat mist a dog, which wolf, I never yeah. used. Okay, the, the what I loved about the wolf is if you get a running start, it's basically invincible. Oh, okay. That's kind of cool. So, like, eats through enemies? Yeah, not initially, but once you get another relic or two relics that upgrade your wolf, yeah, he just, if he's just running, he just dashes through enemies. So, if you got a long stretch, I remember on the left side of the map, I had one. I loved using that wolf. Wow, I didn't know that. That's cool to know. Yeah, I I never used it. I I mean, I tried. I was like, clearly, I should use this for something, but I never found a use for it. So, um, and then there's even some items that give you the ability to traverse things too, like the uh, the <laughs> spike breaking armor. <laughs> it's a little oh. bit of a stretch, but <laughs> but it's kind of cool. Yeah. Cool once you figure out that you're supposed to do that. Up to that point, though, it's like, what am I doing? And the other one was like the night vision goggles. Night vision goggles. What did those do? There's like a dark area on the south, like on the, the very bottom below the castle. It's like in this like kind of cave area. You need it in order to see at one point. Wasn't that the bat's echo location? Oh, it's the Bats Echo. That's what it was. I'm confusing it with another game. But yeah, okay. that yeah, the Echo location was... Uh, <laughs> I was constantly using that like in normal rooms just to see. Like, I was like, what does this do? Because I was always the bat. And so I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was just shooting at walls. Like, maybe this tells me if a wall is breakable or something. And I never so found it. You can use it for one freaking thing. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, really cool. Um Again, it's very Metroid-y. 
obviously in Metroid you don't turn into things, but you still use or if you just equip re- armor. Consider them as tools. I mean, I guess Zelda's the same way. You consider it as a tool, then yeah, it's like it uses that to to you know stifle your progression into certain areas, which was cool. Certainly, by the time you, I I wish games didn't let you fly because to me that's like the ultimate can of worms when a game's like by the way now you can fly it's like okay i'll never to me that just that breaks games and it, it, i grant i enjoyed parts of it that you could fly but I, I missed the parts when i couldn't fly and i just felt a little more restricted <laughs> but i know they like to do it so it's whatever but uh you can cheese a couple boss battles by turning into mist as well from what i understand yeah yeah it looks like i wasn't that good but apparently yeah you can you can cheese them which is funny that actually, the cool things yeah. i didn't really mess with was the librarian thing where you could see how like a, a professional player like took down the bosses after you had beaten them you could purchase their like move sets or something what you can't do it but you can see like what is the ideal way to take down this boss Oh shit! I didn't know that. Yeah, if you go to your file, any boss that you've taken down, if you just use the librarian card and just check it out, it's like the moves are crazy. Like, look at freaking like it's only like a hundred gold. I mean, you probably have tons of gold at this point. Richter taking down the first Dracula thing is crazy. He's like throwing like he starts off with the huge crucifix. He's doing like downward slashes, like a backflip and stuff. It's like I didn't even know you could do these moves. Yeah, how is he doing that shit? That's cool. <laughs> it's there's combos and stuff in the game. It's just it's not spelled out to you. <laughs> I noticed that. There was like a big combo list for one of the moves. I said, I'm not doing that. What the hell is that? <laughs> it's like a fighting game. Yeah. Uh, this game did have items. We kind of we alluded to it, but it I think that's more what made it the RPG that it was. As opposed to not like you can get upgrade your shield, your clothes your sword two items that to me is what made it the most of an rpg the leveling i guess but to me it was just the upgrades you find throughout the the castle which was fine there's nothing wrong with that but uh very cool um i think i ended up with i think it was called alucard's sword at the end you get it at the very top of the upside down castle. Um, I was using a sword that apparently that, that got stronger as you used it, which was really cool. Um, mm. But then that's as you build the uh, exploration percentage, your attack would go up. Oh, is that what that was? Oh, okay. That's one I had. I don't know. Maybe we didn't have the same one. Maybe, but um, but then I got that sword and it was way way better already so i just swapped yeah. it and by then the game was kind of over but uh mm. yeah really cool to see new weapons and there's all these cool like combinations like if you combine the shield rod with the shield a specific shield you can do like an ult- a cool attack or something i didn't get to do it but but it's really cool that they exist and, the, and it's um this game reminded me so much of bloodborne which is um you know a game we were I was supposed to review with JD like forever for like last Halloween or something, um, but it it's like where these items just make such a big impact and it's you kind of base everything off of the item, and I really really enjoyed the different item types they had and the different styles that they imparted on your character. And you just change the way that you fought based on what item you had. And I thought that was really neat. Um, I had a lot of fun trying out the different items, including my fist. I think I think for a, or no, no, it was like a dagger that was like really short, but it was so fast. Like at, at one point in the game, that's what I, that was my weapon was like a dagger, which I would never use in, in like other games. But it, just, it was just so fast. It was fun to use. My favorite was only for cosmetic purposes. It was his cape and you could like adjust the colors to like any color combination of your choice. And so on the interface, it gave you an option to input red, green, and blue numerically zero through 32. 
Whoa. And uh, Alucard's cape would... Uh, it's it's in the library. It's like one of the expensive capes. It's not Alucard's cape. It's called something else. But uh, yeah, you could customize the color. And it was so cool. Like the inside and the outside of the cape. Really? And it was a weapon? Or just, just a cape? Just like an item? Armor. It was just Armor. an item. Okay. I mean, it, it wasn't even the most powerful cape, I don't think. But uh, I, I just liked it. That's such a cool touch. It's such a unique thing to have like a colored cape based on anything you want. Mm-hmm. And customize both sides. Like that's so cool. Alucard in general is stylish. Like I love his moonwalker, you know, dash. Triangle for me. Well, the top button. Did you did you use that a lot? All the time. If I was going back, like just going back to a room I already knew, I would just like moonwalk through the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I tried to get myself to use that more, but I didn't. It's clearly useful, but I never had to use it that much. Maybe it would have made some fights easier. If I, really I don't know it. if I had to use it ever. It's just, <laughs> just, I, I just had fun using it's it. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have spells here. Um, <laughs> there are eight, apparently. Apparently. First one is called Dark Metamorphosis, and it has like that Street Fighter combo you're talking about, where it's like left, diagonal, up, right or diagonal right it's supposed to restore your health it did not restore my health i don't know what the hell i was talking about i can i this is kind of a side tangent i didn't know what hearts were until like the last hour of me playing this game <laughs> like i know that i kept collecting hearts and they would go down and then go up later and i was like i don't know what this means <laughs> and uh apparently it was basically just mana like each item uses different amount of hearts and I had no clue. <laughs> I would just spam it until it didn't work anymore. And then I would just attack with my sword and then eventually heal. It was so I, I there's gotta be a better system than what they, than what they had in there. Um, but it, it wasn't that important, but yeah, spells. I never used any to my knowledge. I think I might have used one on accident at one point. Um, but, Never. But they give you a dark alignment. Or they would have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the combat. We talked about the weapons. We talked about the familiars. I do want to talk about boss fights. Easily sure. the highlight of this game. I, I mentioned that I didn't really like the graphics of this game. You can throw that out if we're talking about some of these boss fights. Um, some of them looked fucking awesome. Specifically in my brain, the one where that's made of corpses and the corpses fall from the, its body. Oh my gosh. The effect like that, like, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Holy shit. Like, that's what I want out of a, P if you're going to do a 2, 2D side scroller on PS1, that's what I'm looking for. The rest of the game is kind of like, eh. Didn't really wow me very much. But some of those boss fights, the effects they had, the 3D like sprinkles that they were able to, to do, where it's just the, the amount of stuff going on on these characters, and it's just all gross. Um, I'm thinking there was like a big bug one that was pretty wild too. Um, but just that stuff looked so freaking cool and really got my blood pumping. I like that one. Yeah, and the way that they like take advantage of space and also how they tie into the narrative. One that stands out to me is that succubus one. Yeah. She's like controlling your mother. And then it's like, you know, Alucard's like, mom, remind me what you said about the humans. And she says, they're, they're incarnate evil and they all must die. And he's like, mother, no, you did not say that. And she's like, wow, I'm the succubus. And then she tries to kill you. <laughs> and she fails and she's like no alucard spare me like i can't no. and yeah there's a, a really great moments overall some tie-ins like throwbacks to previous castlevania games that i liked the first boss battle is like the the wing dude and like the little goblin looking guy those guys are in super castlevania 4 mm. and um they're hard too like you really need to grind a little bit before some of them just to have your skills up or you need to be pretty skilled and read the enemy patterns yeah that taught me a lot that fight specifically to that you can use your shield and you should use your shield 
Um, and so from then on, I was able to to mix and match defense and offense. But um, really good tutorial boss, that one. Um, apparently, there were some bosses that they wanted to add that they couldn't. I didn't put it in here. But one of the names that it was clearly like horror inspired. And one of the ones that they wanted to add was Elizabeth Bathory. Do you know who she is? She's a witch or something. She was a like a countess or whatever would in whatever region she was from, the the equivalent of that. And she thought that young female virgin blood would keep her youthful. So she would literally wow. she literally had like like cages with holes in them and she would put women in it and just have them like skewered. And then she would lay under it uh, and let the blood drip onto her. Yeah, just fucking weird shit. But yeah. I mean, it was so cool that they thought they wanted to add her as like a boss fight in this game, which I'm trying to picture what that would end up looking like, but it would be probably be pretty cool. I'm sure they'd come up with something creative. The connections to mythology were really cool. Like, I mean, first off, Karen is the, not like K-A-R-E-M, but Sharon, I guess, Sharon. Uh, he's the river, uh, you know, the oarsman on the river who ferries people to the underworld. Yeah. He literally ferries you to like go get like a, I don't even know what it is, it's not swimming equipment, but like some relic or something. Yeah. Uh, he's there. Cerberus, like the three headed dog, is there. I think the corpse one is Beelzebub. I'm not sure. Oh. Oh, okay. I'm gonna have to look this up, but I thought I saw Beelzebub's name, which I mean, as an SMT fan, like was just like, oh, yeah, oh, like, that's a great <laughs> moment. Fuck <laughs> yeah, yeah. There were some really cool bosses in it. Definitely, I will say though, and this isn't necessarily a minus, um, but they were very cheesable. A lot of them, which to the point that even I could find it on like my first playthrough against them. Like some of them, I remember distinctly. I was just sitting in the like crouched in a corner of a screen, and just like waiting for them to come, and then I'd hit them, and they would back off, and then do the same motion again. So I remember killing a couple of them that way, and just kind of rolling my eyes, but just being like, "Well, it's a product of the time." I'm sure this <laughs> made more sense back then. Can't all be great bosses, and besides, which if they're going for a more open exploration style, like you know, they can't anticipate like what order you're going to do it. A couple ones were like, there's like a devil, just a common enemy. I don't know if you came across this thing, but it killed me in like two hits. Mm. It wasn't a boss. Mm. No, I don't remember that. It's like towards the end. But yeah. I did a little bit of end grinding. There was an area where you could, it was like you'd fall into a little pit and it had like, I think there were plants. There were little plants on the ground. There were like a bunch of them. And they gave like 300 experience each. And so I just went wow. through that and probably gained like five levels towards the end. Mm. But you didn't really have to grind the game. I, I wouldn't say that at all. Um, and then you do you do fight Richter and Dracula. When you fight Richter, you should add a Shaft. <laughs> <laughs> Why was his name Shaft? Does that... <laughs> <laughs> mean anything besides shaft? If you kill Richter, you're getting the shaft. Oh, there you go. Yeah, Richter, the 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 catalyst for the, either the bad ending or making it past it is a. Uh, you got to have the the glasses. Is it the glasses? Truth that? glasses. The truth equipped. glasses. Yeah. Yeah. Then you can see the orb from Shaft. Yeah. Um, so that was a cool fight. He's he's a pretty tough competitor, but obviously, oh, I didn't know this when I was fighting him because at the time I think I was using, I was using a rod, a holy rod. It's worthless against him. Ah, you have to use like your sword or whatever, which most people I'm sure would use anyway. But yeah, I was using a rod in that fight the first time I did it, and yeah, I was doing like eight damage a hit. Had to change it up a little bit. Mix things up. Dracula was a tough fight. I was over leveled for it. Really? By that point, I had explored maybe 170 or 180 percent of the castle, and mm. the um, gargantuan boss. I had fought him first. I don't know what his, his G name. I mean, he's on the top floor. He's in that really hard to get area. Uh, he gave me a harder time than Dracula did. Okay. I did use like a health restore item, but I, I had the crucifix sub weapon, which takes a hundred hearts and 
it just unleashes like crucifixes everywhere. Mm, damn. So I did that and then I just kind of crouched and, you know, poke, poke, poke. I was going to say, I did the crouch poke <laughs> too towards the end. It's like, oh shit, I can just crouch here in the corner and the, the hand doesn't reach you. Yeah. Shit. So Dracula was <laughs> nothing to me at that point. <laughs> okay. I'm, just, I'm not crazy. Okay. Yeah. It was weird to cheese the final boss, but he was definitely cheesable. Yeah, the game was cheesy. I kind of appreciated that. Everything up to the point was what I really loved about it. You know, mm-hmm. it would have been cool to have like an epic Dracula fight. It just was kind of like this weird formed creature. Like it, it felt weird. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I, well, I, having not played any of the other Castlevanias, I didn't quite know what to expect. Uh, so I was, I was pretty satisfied with it. But. I haven't played any other ones, so maybe the, maybe the other ones are a little more extreme, <laughs> a little more meaty, <laughs> a little meatier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do do you think we need to go more into the RPG mechanics, or you think we're good there? Okay, it's fine. Let's talk about some secrets. Secrets of Castlevania: yeah. Symphony of the Night. Did you know? Richter. And these are what you name your character this after you've you have to do it after you've beaten it? After finishing the game once, you can enter these new names as new character profiles to unlock new features. Plays Richter Belmont. So, gotta enter Richter. Okay, the weird thing, so I was reading one of uh my viewers commented that one of the things he didn't like was when he played as Richter. There was no clarity that to to get up the staircase you have to do like a special move he never gets a double jump mm. he doesn't get the bat he gets like a double jump but there's like a, a special move you have to do but anyways you play as Richter who's got the whip and yeah so that'd be pretty cool and Victor has his own unique ending so if you're trying to really 100% the game you see everything plays Richter uh, you can buy a uh, new accessory doesn't even. It says, there's, I guess there's a couple other name entries that we should just go into. Okay. Um, axe armor, A X E A R M O R. Start with an axe lord armor. It changes Alucard into the axe knight placeholder used in Castlevania Harmony of Despair. If you did not purchase the DLC characters, and then X hyphen X exclamation point V quotation mark Q. Start with 99 luck and a lapis lazuli, but reduce strength. And no, Alucard was Italian. But I guess he is. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool to do the axe armor one. Yeah, I don't even know what that looked like. I guess like the guys in armor with the axes, they throw them low high. Uh, the new accessory in the shop after beating the game is a duplicator. It costs $500,000. And you can use any item without using it up. Um, beat the intro Dracula under 50 seconds with Richter. Use um, Alucard's improvements are approximately plus five points in all stats after you do that. Weird. I, I feel like at that point in the game, I'm not sure why you care. <laughs> not afterwards. I think that that applies for the first playthrough as well. Huh. But it says beat him with Richter. Don't you have to have beaten the game anyway? With no, you, when you start the game, the prologue is. Oh, he plays Richter. gotcha. Okay, that makes more sense. I completely forgot about that prologue. You're right. Okay. Cool. That would be kind of neat. Uh, Heaven Sword Magic Strike. Equip two Heaven Swords and press both attack buttons simultaneously. What's Castlevania Harmony of Despair? It keeps mentioning this. Is that one of the? Game Boy Advance ones or something? It's Harmony at Dissonance. It's confusing. I don't know what Harmony at Despair is. I'll look it up real quick. Okay. Shield Rod Magic. Equip the Shield Rod in, with another shield and simultaneously press both attack buttons. It does something cool. Librarian Secrets. Use the Grav Boots and Ram. I'm getting this from um, IGN.com. Fellas. Yeah, the fellas over at IGN. <laughs> Use the grav boots and ram Alucard's head up his ass without landing. You'll get some special items after multiple rams. Life up. Ram a librarian in the butt. 
Yeah. Chess. Life up, Ring of Arcana, Axe Lord Armor, and Dracula Tunic. Journey of Despair uh, released for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. It was like a weird, I don't know if it's a download only title, um, but it's like a co op Castlevania where you can play like one to eight people. They have it on the Series S, but I guess nobody plays online, what I've read. Mm. So it's kind of, eh. So those are some nifty little secrets. There's something about peanuts I don't quite understand. Underneath a peanut after tossing it to eat it. Uh, use the, wait, no, eating peanuts hold. It looks right, like a button. Peanut. Hold upright yeah. or something? I don't know. Um, I think maybe it was like special items that you would pick up from certain characters or something, like for health. There you go. Anyway, nifty secrets. Let's talk about secrets of the night. Yeah. <laughs> secrets. Of the night. <laughs> let's talk about the legacy of the game. Um, yeah, let's do it. In the in the Shmups interview, they said they asked, "Please tell us about any events, ideas, or characters that had to be cut from Symphony of the Night." Also, if there's any post game story for Richter, Maria, or Alucard. Igarashi said, "As far as the story goes, I have deeper and more involved dialogue planned, but I thought it would interrupt the game progression too much, so we took it out." There are many characters who had to be cut, but the ones I still wish... Oh, this is where it is. Were, could have added were Elizabeth Bathory and Gillis de Rye. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. As for post-game stories, Alucard and Maria's whereabouts are unknown. Richter uses this as an opportunity to pass the vampire killer to the Morris family, who are relatives of the Belmonts. He disappears with Annette. After this, the reputation of the Belmont name as vampire hunters vanishes from history. However, that doesn't mean the Belmont bloodline has died out so perhaps they will rise again as vampire hunters someday. Uh, did are there future Castlevanias that use Belmonts? Do you know? Yeah. Okay. So this places it before Bloodlines because he's given the whip to the Morrises, and then the Morrises, like Quincy Morris, we were reading earlier, died in eighteen ninety seven or killed Dracula. Then, and uh, John Morris gets the vampire killer. Uh, so that's the connection here. Okay. Gotcha. There's Quincy or somebody else I couldn't tell you. Furukawa says, In a sense, I don't think I can really say much about Alucard's distant future. As for Richter, the events of Bloodlines create the background for the story of Symphony of the Night, and I can't confirm what happens to the Belmont clan after Richter. But that being the case, have you thought about what the future might hold? I like to think that one of the Belmonts is, unbeknownst to all, locked in battle with the King of Terror, prophesied by Nostradamus to appear in July. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also like to say that although Maria chases after Alucard in the ending of Symphony of the Night, he doesn't make her a vampire. She isn't around 10,000 years later, you know? Mm. How do we know that? Why do we not know that? I don't know. 87. I guess we'd have to play some of like the DS ones or something or the Game Boy Advance to see if that if they made any notable changes to any of these characters. Uh... T- Okay, so I'm in harmony of dissonance right now, and the main character's just Belmont, and like he's in the castle with his friend, but there's no mention of Alucard. Something about Maria. Circle of the Moon is considered a Gaiden. Not really in the canon, although it kind of is, but got retconned. Um, and then there was another one, Area of Sar- Sorrow, which I know nothing about. So, as far as GBA lore goes, I haven't seen any connections. Or, and I, I don't know the Harmony Distance one close enough to say, you know, what's just Belmont's connection. Is he just a Belmont? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's literally them telling you that. That's funny. Yeah, it's just Belmont here. <laughs> the Castlevania series is known as a 2D action game that sets the bar high with a very high difficulty. I think with the emphasis of RPG elements in Symphony, more players than ever have been allowed to enjoy the series. How has the response from fans been in that regard? Igarashi says, the one thing we heard the most was it's too easy. We expected to hear that, though. There were also some people who said it was too difficult, and it brought home to me the difficulty of making something for everyone. Symphony of the Night has also gained a lot of support from female users. Definitely because of the difficulty setting, but perhaps also because of the visual style. What's so, up, all you females out there? 
There you go. So in addition to <laughs> allowing people who couldn't beat previous Castlevanias to play, we've also successfully broken through to a whole new class of players, and I'm very happy that we've overturned the hard game image of Castlevania. Furukawa says, many people also said, I don't know anything about Castlevania, and this was fun. I have mixed feelings about that. <laughs> Furukawa is just joking the entire time. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you do you see that as a shift that it went from a hard game to more of like a anybody can play it game with with maybe this entry? Well, anyone could play the ones prior. I actually think that the they're pretty air up to that point. Infinite credits. Um, the time limit was never a big factor on the NES one. Super is not a big factor either. Bloodlines doesn't have a time limit, but has three credits and a password system. So even though the levels were hard, I never saw those three games as overly difficult. Rondo of Blood literally lets you pick which stage you want to play on. Hmm. I understand Dracula X is kind of hard. Two is weird, so I kind of avoided it. And then three is really hard. So that's that I'd say is like a hard hardest of the bunch. But the shift is notable because this is a game that you can actually just grind and get better at to make counters as easy or as hard as you want them to. If you're trying to speed through through the game, you know, you'll probably die a couple times. But if you take your time and explore and get the best weapons and upgrades and spend time on that, mm-hmm. you know, picking your best familiar. Yeah, this game is very accessible. I think what's hard is exploration. It's just a different kind of hard, figuring out where to go. That's the type of challenge that wasn't in the other Castlevanias. So they don't need the uh, platforming difficulty, the action difficulty, kind of a little bit, you know, and it has it in certain aspects, but definitely not everywhere. But uh, I think it's, if if I was to use one word for Symphony of the Night, it would be balanced. It's really well balanced. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't have anything to say on that one, so I'll just <laughs> defer to you. Because um, I like the style of the new ca- of this Castlevania going forward, but I hadn't really played much of the other ones. Um, I didn't know that I didn't. I didn't know that they had a hard game image. Is that have you heard that? Is that is that what people think of Castlevania? That it's a hard That's what game. I thought of the NES one. When I played it with the uh, no save states on the NES, I felt really accomplished. Like stage five is notoriously difficult. Death is throwing scythes around the screen and he's hopping from one side to the other and you can take literally three hits and that's after getting through a hallway of Medusa heads and axe armors. If you just say the phrase Medusa heads to people who've played the NES ones, they'd know what you're talking about. Wow. Playing as crippled Simon walking down a hallway of like up and down Medusa heads while an axe knight is throwing axes at you low and high, and you have to figure out which one's which and somehow make it to the end of the hallway with enough health to fight death. <laughs> yeah. And that's just stage five. I'm not even talking about the rest of the game. And that's not even the hardest. Three is the hardest. Wow. All right. I guess it was pretty hard then. It's the NES ones. Like we were saying, like the Super Nintendo and the Genesis ones, for as good as they are, and I, and Rondo, uh, they're not as iconic as either Castlevania NES or Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Mm-hmm. So I think they fall through the weeds a little bit. I think they really counter the difficulty argument because they're still hard and hard in the ways they should be. But you know what it is. I'm going to skip through this next section. Uh, we'll come back to it when we talk about the next one. But first, let's let's just talk about Metroidvania real quick. Um, Text my therapist. Yeah. I think we're going to differ on this one. But Metroidvania, yeah, what is it? I guess that's really the problem, isn't it? But to me, Metroidvania is non-linear platforming I think that might actually be it to me maybe if you add exploration based non-linear platforming anything else el- anything else you add to it starts <laughs> even that to me starts making it go haywire 
But yeah, you could say with RPG elements, and I'm a little bit hesitant to say that, but that's to me, that's what it is, is nonlinear exploration-based platforming. So isn't that just Metroid? Um yeah, it's more Metroid. <laughs> but to me, what makes Castlevania what it is is more the Metroid style. The RPG to me is not as important. Now I'm going to pass it off to you because I know you don't necessarily love the term, but when you hear Metroidvania, what are you thinking? Mine is your definition just with things that make an RPG an RPG. Stat upgrades and equipable weapons and armor. But wouldn't that take Metroid out of the equation? Yeah, which is why it's not just a Metroid. It's a Metroidvania, which is inherently, I disagree with this term, but just for the sake of what the phrase is used to describe or depict, it's those type of games. Games with like a distinct progression in terms of your character and your growth. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily mean in like a vague way, like with like, you know, Link and Hearts or, you know, Samus and, you know, energy containers. I mean, like, you know, where you're leveling up. Because that's what happens in Symphony of the Night. That's where this came, this, this, you know, this term was born from. Yeah. I think maybe, maybe if I changed it to where, because I'm hesitant with the RPG element part. But maybe if I if I added, I'd be more comfortable with with character growth because in that way, then it encompasses both to me. Where Metroid is like, maybe it doesn't level up. She doesn't level up. I guess, Samus, uh, she doesn't level up per se, but she gets strong, more missiles, and she gets more health, and she gets more a new item that does this, and through growth you progress throughout the, the game. So is Zelda a Metroidvania? Well, it's going to be side-scroller. Side, the side-scroller. It has to be a side-scroller yeah. game to be a Metroidvania. To me, yeah. Oh, okay. So if you, is Metroid a Metroidvania? Yeah, to me. Oh. Um, examples that, that feel like they borrow it but aren't, like Dark Souls is very metroidvania except that it's not a side scroller so i don't really consider it one although it certainly takes some of those elements in fact most i think most at this point most like action games probably pull from this to some extent um so we just played resident evil 2 yeah it has a metroid map right it has item based progression yeah yeah is resident evil a metroidvania that's not a side scroller to me, Nowadays, people are using this to say 3D Metroidvanias. You know? Well, so if, they, like, if, they, if they add 3D to it, I think it's fair. But it, it, once you're doing that, you're, I mean, just like adding RPG to something, you're kind of bastardizing it, which is, yeah, it happens. Which is what this term is. This is a bastardization. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a finicky term, which all, all terms in games are mostly finicky at this point. Because we've gotten yeah. to such a level of in gaming where... You can now easily combine them. Like back in the day, Final Fantasy was basic. That was that was an RPG, and that and you couldn't really. They weren't doing like huge things where you could combine all this, but like Mario was Mario, and Final Fantasy was an RPG. Nowadays, yeah. it's it's so muddy, and everything's combined partially because of this game that we're playing. Yeah. Is they were like, let's add RPG elements to it. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I I agree with that assessment. I think most genre names are like meaningless. An adventure game? What you go on an event action? You game with Dude, action? adventure. I don't even know what an adventure game is now. <laughs> <laughs> I guess to be adventure is like point and click almost. Like <laughs> that's a type of adventure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything's an adventure. I mean, that's what, crazy. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. Most meaningful genre names are like you know, uh, I guess like racing. Mm. You know. Or like I think they're very like granular, but when you go into these more abstract ones, yeah, you know, I think even puzzle is ambiguous. Right, right. Because I mean, you could make a very strong argument that SMT is more of a puzzle game than an RPG, Just, especially three, mm -hmm. because the bosses are so like 
they're not even based on damage almost like half of them are based on like knowing the pattern and understanding what will do what when they when you use it so like they're almost just more puzzle games than rpgs it's crazy how much all these terms are now combined into one which is good it's a good thing it's a good thing because it you know the the people that make these games are being creative and finding new ways to to employ it those genres don't the problem they don't have is being distinctly associated to two specific video game franchises That's true. yeah yeah that, it's 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 interesting when something happens like that like souls like we get that now right. rogue like cuz like there was a game i believe called rogue that that's pioneered that um so it's weird when it's like one it's like a specific game cuz then you then you when they're named after the game now you're like this wasn't in Castlevania so how could you call it a, <laughs> a metroidvania yeah. like now it's like it's a, it gets to, it makes it a weird conversation because yeah you're right it's like that's the game that it's supposed to emulate and what further complicates this term is it like appeals to the the second rift castlevania fans not the first right it completely alienates the people <laughs> from the, like the, <laughs> before this where it was like a, just a side scroller because they're like this is literally castlevania and it's like no it's not <laughs> <laughs> not by castlevania not now <laughs> <laughs> your experiences are nullified <laughs> yeah yeah, I can see how so, people. Yeah, just it doesn't. It's it's very difficult. It's not even that I'm that passionate about either Metroid or Castlevania. I actually think the Metroid phrase makes more sense than Castlevania logically. If you just think about it, it's just like a lack of critical thought when using the term, and just like the how quick people are to adopt it. Mm -hmm. And of course, Igarashi says it's a Zeldavania. So there you go. Who knows what the right, <laughs> right answer is. Yeah. Well, they call Bloodstained an Egavania. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, they say Egavania Returns. I think that's like on the box or something. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, the, the phrase, if you want to know what the people in Japan say, they call this genre search action. They don't use the phrase Metroidvania. Search action. Like an like an exploratory action game, yeah, that makes sense. I'm down with that. And then it stemmed from a certain game. I I wonder if I can get this up real quick. Search action games origin. History, while not the first game of its kind. Uh. Metroid is generally considered the most influential in the Metroidvania genre. It's from the wiki on Metroidvania. Have it so someone in the comments you can get uh, bonus points for naming it. Okay. Yeah, put it in the comments if you know the original search action game. Quest. <laughs> RPG quest. <laughs> well, if you wanted to play Castlevania, there's certainly a lot of ways to do it in 2023. Uh, do, do you want to go down the list of all the different ways you can play Castlevania at this point? Sure. And we are talking specifically about Castlevania Symphony of the Night, one of the most beloved in the Castlevania series. Uh, so it originally released on the PlayStation 1. And then it was remade for the Saturn. However, for the PlayStation 1, there is a Greatest Hits version available as well. It's the black label versus the green label. There was a version of Symphony of the Night that was unlockable and included in the Dracula X Chronicles for the PlayStation Portable. For the Xbox 360, the original PlayStation 1 version was ported and for the playstation 4 and playstation 5 castlevania symphony of the night is playable in the castlevania requiem collection which includes castlevania symphony of the night as well as castlevania rondo of blood 
And then for all you iOS and Android users out there, you can download the game. Talk please, about some prices. Please tell me how that is if you've played the iOS or Android port. <laughs> I'm very curious. <laughs> so let's start with uh, loose copies. So for the PlayStation 1, you could get a disc only version of the game for about $50. That's on eBay prices. For the Sega Saturn, you could get it loose for $117. PlayStation Portable, you could get it disc only for $20. And uh, let's leave the other ones out for a moment. Let's just stick with the physical versions. Okay. So to get it complete, you get it complete for the Japanese PlayStation 1 for about $50 or $99 for the US PlayStation 1. You want the greatest hits version or I think the black label one. I think the black label one is $200 from what I was seeing. Although you might be able to find it cheaper. I did a quick eBay search. Uh, if you want the Sega Saturn version complete, you're going to spend $219. It's pre-tax. If you want the PlayStation Portable version complete, you could spend about $40. Uh, if you're a shrink wrap like your game's graded, um, this one's for you. PlayStation 1, it will go for $252 new graded $750, whatever that means. For the Sega Saturn, it is $373, graded out of $400. For the PlayStation Portable, you can get it shrink-wrapped for $65. Now let's go into these download versions. For the Xbox 360 download, you're going to spend about $10. I think it's $9.99. I got it on my Xbox Series S as well. They let you download 360, certain select 360 titles. That's one of them. Uh, for the PS4 slash PS5, the Requiem Collection is about $20. On sale for five and, as of this recording. Wow. Go up in time? <laughs> let's go up. Yeah, let's see. All right. And then uh, for iOS and Android, I was reading $299. <laughs> oh, sick. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yep. And that's two dollars and ninety nine cents, not two hundred ninety nine dollars. That would be a crazy download. Two hundred ninety nine dollar download. Yeah, or be like saying, give you fifty eight n worth or fifty eight dollars worth, two hundred ninety nine dollars worth of Castlevania, which you would be spending if you're getting some of these uh, old versions. Yeah. So, uh, which one did you play? I played the PS4, PS5 collection. Requiem. I played the Xbox 360 version through to completion, and then I've owned the uh, Requiem collection, and I've played a little bit of it, although I've never beaten it on that console. So, so I, yeah, go ahead. Speak to your experience with it first. Uh, well, I was just going to say the difference between them. Should... Yeah, yeah, go for it. The PS1 is obviously the original. Uh, I wanted to talk about the Saturn one. In 1998, a port of Symphony of the Night was released in Japan for the Sega Saturn. Uh, Maria Renard is both a fully playable character as well as a boss fight, which is the one I te guess technically I played. Richter is available to play at the start of the game in this one. Um, when playing the game as Alucard, a third hand is available, but only for stat-altering items like food and potions and not weaponry. Alucard can use exclusive items such as the Godspeed boots, which grant him the ability to run like Richter. New areas, the cursed prison and the underground garden have new and they have new bosses. Um, has remixes of songs from previous Castlevania games. Unfortunately, loading is more frequent and takes longer in other versions. Um, because the Saturn has limited hardware transparency support, transparency effects such as the mists and the waterfall were replaced with dithering effects. Um, there is some translucency in uh, the boss fights though. Um, the graphics were stretched to fill the screen, causing some sprites to be distorted. The overall port of the Saturn ports video is said, according to Igarashi, to be lower than the PlayStation version because it is a, sim a simple port handled by another team that, and was not programmed to take advantage of the Saturn's 2D capabilities. Igarashi was overall disappointed with the Saturn version, and he quoted, 
I understand why fans who've never played the Saturn version would be interested in those features, but I really, really don't feel good about them. I couldn't put my <laughs> name on that stuff and present it to Castlevania fans. So the version that I played, I believe, is essentially the PS1 version with some of the Saturn stuff added to it. This is the PSP version. Which, which is, basically yes. is, yeah. Um, but uh, yours also has substituted dialogue and voice acting. Yes. So if you wanted some of the classic things that they said in the original, they weren't in it. Like the famous pixel lines, like what is a something but like a, a bunch what is of a man. Yeah, what is a man? Yeah. That's not in it. So like that yeah. that stuff is removed, which is probably a little disappointing because yes, it's but, dumb and cheesy, but it I mean it's part all of you it. Xbox owners out there do get that version. There you go. So hey. The Xbox version is basically man. the P the original PSX release, right? Yeah, except uh, it's just the the <laughs> there's, these are all problematic. This uh, fraction of the screen with like a, a Alucard Dracula family wallpaper in the back is very bizarre. <laughs> and you could stretch the screen to, like to make it like look bigger, but it, it never looks perfect. Uh... The good thing is I didn't even after a while, it just kind of like it goes in the background. You don't really notice it. Yeah. Um, and. I had a great time playing the 360 version. Nice. So pick your version. Don't as long as it's not the Saturn one. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, one thing this game had that not many at the time did, although it was becoming more and more popular, was multiple endings. Um, total of five. Total of at least. Uh, looks like. If you're under 196%, and this means essentially you're After doing, completion. you've done like everything, you've beaten Dracula. Yeah, we're going to, let's do good endings first. Okay, okay. Good okay, endings. So these are good endings. Yeah. Two so, good endings. Wow. Yeah. One great ending. <laughs> um, so for the good endings, if you're under 196% of the map completed, and you will just get kind of a standard good ending where Alucard has, you know, found Shaft using the, the see-through goggles, uh, destroyed him, you know, set Richter free, and uh, taken down Dracula. As him and uh, Maria and Richter are standing outside the Castlevania, uh, watching it collapse, um, Alucard, I think, goes into um, the sunset and then... Richter and Maria are having a conversation and uh, basically say, oh, let him go. I can't help him anyway. All right. Well, he, great job, bud. That's the ending I got. You got that ending too? Yeah. You're a giga... Um, I want a good... A giga Vlad in honor of Dracula. For Giga Vlad, you have over 196% map completion, uh, where instead of that outcome, it's the same outcome, except Maria will chase after Alucard. Alucard, wait! And Richter's left to his lonesome. Let's talk bad endings. I know you and I both have some experience with this. Yeah. Um, if you defeat Richter just straight up, um, without the glasses, which is how I first did it. I don't. Is that how you did it too? Yeah. Alucard laments Richter's falling to evil. It's like, oh shoot. He, he. I guess, like you said, I think, I think you said it that humanity has fallen. <laughs> <laughs> and if you beat him, if you, I didn't even think about this. But if you defeat him with the holy glasses on, so you're just a dickhead. Maria appears <laughs> and Alucard apologizes. <laughs> that's the best ending. <laughs> that's, yeah. Oh, to me, that's the freaking <laughs> most awesome ending there is. It's like, you knew he was a good guy. It's like, yeah, I did, bitch. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the credits roll. <laughs> Hashtag fake apology. <laughs> and then the Richter ending... Is this a bad I play is, as Richter? Is this just the ending, or 
So he doesn't get to the inverted castle. I think his final battle is like either fighting Vlad or not Vlad. What am I, why am I calling Vlad? Shaft. Sure. Fighting Shaft. Okay. In um, the main castle. All right. Well, he's defeated Shaft. That's it. Just watch his. Future of the series. Well, usually when we do these, a lot of times when we do this, it's it's more talking about the future of the series, especially if it's like a newer game. You're kind of wondering what's going to happen. This game is from 1997. Um, so the future of Castlevania is really interesting because from here on, it was all games like Symphony of the Night until... Or it's a shadow Somewhere, or something. Yeah, like PS2 era. They're like, let's make it 3D. Now, I've never played one, so I, I'm i not here to cast judgment or anything. But from the outside looking in, it seemed like this was not a good move. I don't know. I, again, I've never played it. Some people seem to like it. But no one... I've heard people have reverence for... NES to Super Nintendo era Castlevania. I heard people have reverence for Symphony of the Night and the games that are like it. It's very, very rare that I hear people talk about these 3D ones. In fact, the, the one 3D one I hear the most about is the N64 one. <laughs> and it's not not positive. Not positive, yeah. I've never played it, but I'm just that's what I've heard. I'm a fan, for the record. Yes. I, I'm I'm also a little jaded. So. Do you now? That's all I really have on it. As far as the future, future of the series, we obviously Igarashi has made um, Bloodstain. So I haven't played it, but I'm sure it's probably similar to Symphony of the Night. I, but uh, somebody can correct me. I think I've seen screenshots. It looks kind of older than Symphony of the Night. It almost looks like an NES game. Air 2, so that's Ritual of the Night. Oh, and then there's another one called something Curse, else? Curse of Darkness or something. It's, I don't know. But yeah, the, I think the Curse of Darkness is the 8-bit one. And then Ritual of the Night, I might be getting this backwards, is the more, okay. like, I don't know, like 3D, 2D looking one. Okay, okay. So there's, there's a couple of them. Um, I don't know. I, if this were done, if we did this last year, I would have said the series is dead completely. Um, but at the PlayStation Direct earlier this year, they've officially announced a remake for Metal Gear Solid 3. Like complete full-on remake. So I guess Konami is dipping back into gaming a little bit. Maybe they're testing their waters with the Metal Gear Solid and see how it goes. I don't know what the relationship is like between these people. It sounds like it's not great between Konami and Igarashi, but I, I don't know. Maybe that's just like, Hey, sorry, we can't make them. And he says, okay, bye. Thank you. I, I don't know if it was amicable. Um, so it's hard to say, but, um, it does not look good still for the future. That's all I'd really know. What about you? What complicates this a little bit for me is that it used to be like the sentiment online was fuck Konami, fuck Konami, where's my Castlevanias, you know, where's my, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm not a big Konami fan, so I can't tell you all that stuff, but I guess they did the Metal Gear 2, so that's why you bring that up. But they did bring the Castlevania Advance Collection within the past year or two, I want to say. Uh, so, and obviously they can't really do that with the DS, Um you know, challenge me, prove me wrong, but um A Trin Odyssey. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't count. Uh, <laughs> by the way, I have like forty five hours in that um A Trin Odyssey five. But I think that there is a craving, at least I have a craving for like this level or this magnitude of game. I gotta tell you, I haven't felt that scale or that like impact in a game in a while and the second that inverted castle hit in symphony of the night it was just like poof, like 
synapses connecting, like just like reforming everything I knew about the game. And it was so cool. I was just trying to think like, what's the last game I played that had like a moment like that where it just turns the game on its head. And I don't know that like maybe other Castlevanias do, you know, going forward, but I played circle of the moon through, didn't really feel it played harmony of distance. It's got to that point. It's kind of like, eh. um, I, the only games that I think actually do the genre Metroidvania justice that I've played are Ori, you know, and the, the blind forest. I think that's a game that has that kind of significance. But if you look up like, you know, top 10 games like symphony of the night, it's the same games. Ori hollow Knight. Uh, I don't, I don't even know the other ones. I think they literally put other Castlevania games, play some, yeah, yeah. we'll you yeah. know, <laughs> so it's, it's rare. And so Very. maybe it's not Konami who does it. Maybe it's, Oh, you know what? They, you know what they reference? They reference the bloodstained game. I'm sure. If you want to play a game like Symphony of the night, play Iga's game. So I'm just like curious. It might be Konami. It might be somebody else, but I think that there is a future, or this style or like you know this type of game i just think it's when you get a game like this it's a gem mm -hmm. so rare and i would love to see it um well don't you think that might be unfair to every game that comes out after is that you're comparing it to to this which was so monumental at the time and now it's like um you're not you're never going to recreate that castle moment <laughs> it's not going to happen unless somebody does something fucking absolutely well, I don't need, amazing i don't need every game to do it um in fact i wasn't dissatisfied with circle of the moon like i had a good time and i appreciate it for what it was my problem with harmony of dissonance right now is that it is literally emulating the <laughs> symphony of the night formula to a t oh dang and on like lesser hardware so for as like, you know, basic as some of the visuals may have even seemed on PS1, it's even, <laughs> you know, lesser. So like, I just need that inspiration. You know, I need to, to see that in order to be like, yeah, this is, I get the same feelings as I did with Symphony of the Night. Not that I need another Symphony of the Night, mm -hmm. but you know, I don't, I don't know if that makes sense or if that's too rambly. No, it's, it's hard to say. I just think as a series, it's probably dead. But as a genre, I mean, it's alive and kicking. People are always trying to chase that. Uh, there's There's been a lot of indie games that try to do it. Um, there was one that came out that was probably more Metroid, but it was still, it had the same Axiom Verge. Um, that one's yeah, pretty... It, it was close. I don't think it quite hit the same scale as Metroid. But um, keep on trying. Sure. Just as a series, I just don't. It's not impossible now. Now that they they've kind of brought gotten back, like dipped their toes back in gaming, but it just doesn't seem likely. And if it, they do, it's probably not going to be the thing that you wanted anyway. Oh, I don't even know what would I want from a Symphony of the Night remake. Do I even want a Symphony of the Night remake? I do. Just for, just way? for the, the 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 graphics to improve. Okay. And they could probably you type, wanted, okay. uh, uh, change the gameplay a little bit just to be more modern, but the gameplay isn't that bad, so it's not. It wouldn't be that big of a thing. Um, just add content to it, and then update the graphics, fix, add some story to it that might not have been in there. Maybe make some like more exploration based story, so you can just find things to learn about the world. I think it would be cool. Do I think it's going to happen? Mm, not a chance. <laughs> not, not, yeah. not a shot in hell especially if Igarashi's not involved in it it's like why would you even want it but as a, you know I can dream <laughs> a man can dream is Pixar. radical dreamer yeah I'm the radical dude that should be my moniker <laughs> the radical dreamer that would be so eye rolly <laughs> <Make it. laughs> the radical, radical dreamer. dreamer here with RPG archive <laughs> I got it again Living, living my dreams to the fullest. <laughs> right, gamers, when you dream, dream radical. Dream radical, bro. Well, that's <laughs> it for Castlevania Symphony of the Night. We did it. Woo. Thanks for joining me, Teddy. I know it's been a long one. It's fun. A lot yeah, of meat on the bone, Yeah. Yeah. Classic Castlevania reference. A classic Vania. What do you think, Spence? You got it in you for any more of the 
Vanias? Newer ones. DS era. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Love that 3DS. Yeah. Um, probably not the old ones because I don't, I don't, they don't jive with me. But maybe the newer ones. I don't. know. We can revisit it later. Maybe that uh, that bloodstained one. Maybe that makes the most sense. Yeah, I'd be down for that. That'd be interesting. Heard it was pretty good. I own it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed it too, listening at home. And uh, uh, put in your comments if you like Castlevania or not. I don't know. Just put something in the comments. That's all I ask. <laughs> Have you played this game? If so, how? What version? How do your thoughts compare to ours? Yeah. All right. Well, we can consider Castlevania Symphony of the Night archived. Thanks for watching. See you next time.